All right. Um, you ever have those things that's kind of like a God thing happen to you that um, um, something will happen and then it won't happen until months later that you find out exactly the connection? Well, we went through the story, and as we were going through the story, I kept thinking, what's next? What do we do next? I really want to see us grow. I don't, you know, okay, now we know the story, but now what? And I really wanted to do a, a study on discipleship. And so we had started this a few years ago, Lynette and I and Matt and Rachel and a couple other people, but we never finished it. And um, so I thought, that would be a really great thing to study. So we decided we were going to do that. And I wanted to start off with some oomph. There's no video to this thing, right? So you, you have to kind of go through it. And where we had the video with the story, we had the video with, you know, uh, the other ones we've done. And it kind of gives you that little push. So I thought, man, I don't have a video. So I was trying to find something on being a disciple. And I searched and searched, couldn't find the right thing. And I just had to remember that a friend of mine who was a pastor at the Vineyard Church over there in Owasso had given me this DVD um, by Andy Stanley. And it's, it was called, What is a Christian? So I just thought, while I was grasping the straws, I put that DVD in. And it blew me away. It was exactly what I was looking for. In fact, so much that it actually changed the way that I looked at my faith. It is, it is a very powerful video. Everyone that was in our group saw it. We were, we were all just amazed at it. So what I want to do this morning, as you can see, um, I'm going to be talking about what we're studying, just to kind of give you guys an idea. And what I want to do is I want to show you a little clip from this video, and then we're going to go into the, to the message. So. Very, 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 very consistently to describe 
these people that were part of this Jesus movement. It's a terrifying term. It's the term disciple. And the reason this is a terrifying term, it should disturb you, <laughs> is because it is so clearly defined. You can hide behind Christianity all day long. You can go to war in the name of Christianity. You can do all kinds of things in the name of Christianity. You can define it, redefine it, misdefine it, undefine it. You can do all kinds of stuff with Christian. But I'm telling you, you lock into this word, open your New Testament, and oh my goodness. A few examples, the one we just looked at from Acts chapter 11, remember this? The disciples, think about the significance of this verse now. The disciples were called Christians. If you would ask the followers of Jesus, what are you? They would have said, they wouldn't have said Christian, they would have said what? I'm a disciple. I'm a disciple. But the disciples who called themselves disciples were first called Christians. Now, from this point forward, look throughout the New Testament, you're going to see this word over and over and over. Now, what is a disciple? Well, the English word disciple means the same thing as the Greek word um, disciple, methetos. It, it simply means a learner, a pupil, an apprentice, an adherent, a follower. A disciple is a person that does this. I'm trying to make a decision. How would you handle this? That's how I'll handle it. Oh, I, I'm, I'm trying to decide how to respond to a situation. How would you respond to that situation? Oh, that's how I'll respond to that situation. What would you do if you were me? Then that's what I'm going to do. Where are you going? Then that's where I'm going to go. How would you react to this? How do you live your life? How do you manage relationships? Oh, then that's how I'll live my life. That's how I'll manage my relationships. A disciple is a person that's looking to someone to say, give me direction, show me how to live my life. And the answer, before you even give me the answer, I want you to know the answer is yes. 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 Now, what is it you think I should do? See, that's different than Christian, isn't it? Christian, disciple. In fact, the word disciple is uncomfortable. In fact, you're hoping at the end of this message, I'm not going to say, which I'm not, so... I'm not going to say, so from now on, we're not going to use the word Christian anymore. We're going to tell people we're disciples. You're going to be like, mm, I can't do that. That's just weird. I mean, but that's my point. See, it's, it's kind of hard to dodge the word and misdefine and redefine. Disciple. Here's some other examples. Just again, you find them throughout the New Testament. So the word of God spread and the number of, not Christians, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And then here's one about the Apostle Paul. This is pretty interesting. When he came to Jerusalem, Paul, I remember Paul persecuted the church. He like just he murdered, he put people in prison. He was trying to get rid of the church, and then he became a follower of Jesus. And so the people who were followers of Jesus, they didn't trust him because they think, oh, you're just trying to infiltrate, you know, you know, be an insider so you can have us all arrested. So he decides to try to join the church. When he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. And he thought that was a band. No, this was actually what they call the people who followed Jesus. And this isn't the 12 disciples. That's the apostles. This is just the general group of people who follow Jesus. So the apostle Paul tries to join the disciples. Not Christians. They didn't use that term. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. That's how they describe themselves. And then here's cool. There was actually disciplettes. So this is just women. You need to know this, okay? Check this out. In Joppa, there was a disciple or disciplette named Tabitha. So even women could be disciples. It's awesome. She was always doing good and helping the poor. So the point so far in this series is we can hide behind the word Christian. But if you look into the New Testament and ask the question, what were these people really about and how did they describe themselves? They refer to themselves and to each other as disciples, which brings us to this terrifying, disturbing question. And it's this. Are we disciples? Or are we just Christians? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Or are you just a Christian? Are you a follower of Jesus? Is your answer, yes, Jesus? It doesn't matter what the question is. It's yes. Or are you a Christian? See, that, that, that's, just, that's just disturbing, isn't it? So what... Isn't that a cool video? So that's the question, isn't it? Are we disciples? Are we disciples? 
nor are we just Christians. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not bashing the name Christian or being a Christian in any way. I mean, but don't you think we're called to be something more than that? Do you think that Christ died on that cross so that we could go to church on Sunday and be good moral people? Well, that stuff's important, but do you think that's really what it's about? Is that really what it's all about? You know, when I talked about the study, I had people say to me, well, you know, I don't really want to do that. I, you know, I'm not into that thing. Or, or I've done that before. Um, you know, it really doesn't interest me. But if we're really followers of Christ, we are disciples. We are disciples. You know, the word Christian was used three times in the whole Bible. The whole Bible, three times. The word disciples used 259 times. That's crazy if you think about it. And like he said, the only time it was used was as a derogatory term back in the day. If you were a, a Christian, you were it was like being a deadhead, you know, or something, or a, a stoner or whatever. It was a deadhead to somebody who follows a grateful dead. <laughs> So, the point is, it's like he says, you know, they, they refer to themselves as disciples. They don't refer to themselves as Christians. Again, not saying that that's a bad word. Um, so, what is a disciple? Well, he kind of went over that. I looked it up in uh, Webster's. And it said, one who receives uh, instruction from another, a scholar, a learner, especially a follower who has learned to believe in the truth of the doctrine of his teacher. To learn to believe in the truth of the doctrine of his teacher. You know, we look at becoming a disciple and you wonder, well, how do I become a disciple? What is it exactly it does that entail? It really is the same thing as becoming a Christian, but there's one thing tagged on to the end. I mean, if you look at it, you know, first thing we do, obviously, is we repent, right? We must repent of our sins, and 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Number two, we acknowledge Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Invite him into your, into your heart. Turn your life over to him. And number three, and this causes a lot of turmoil, I mean, I've had a lot of discussions with people on this one, is to be baptized. You know, you got to be baptized to be saved. This question keeps popping up. But the thing about it is, you want to be a disciple, you have to be baptized. If we're to follow Jesus, what's the first thing that Jesus did in his ministry? The very first thing. He went and got baptized. John says, what are you doing? I can't baptize you. You're, I can't even tie your sandals. And what did Jesus tell him? You must baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. It's part of the process. You know, I, I can't stand up here and explain everything that happens through baptism because I don't think we really know. It's a spiritual thing. But in Acts 2.37, when the people were convicted of the sin, they Peter and the other apostles. This thing's annoying. Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those three things like we, we know, you know as Christians that's kind of a normal, right? You do that, right? You repent, you acknowledge Christ, you get baptized. But the last one is a tough one. And that's to commit yourself to learning and following his commands. That one's not so easy. Because of that one word, right? Commit. Commit yourself. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Now as I looked up the word grace in this, because later on you'll see, I was going to use grace and um, it kind of taught me a whole other meaning for the word grace. And if you read this, that verse, it kind of tells you that. 
It says to grow in the grace. Well, if grace is forgiveness, we can't grow in forgiveness, right? We're already forgiven. But I don't think that's what God means when he gives you his grace. He gives you his power. And by, by growing in our faith, what happens? We receive more power from the Holy Spirit. We're stronger. When the devil attacks us, we're stronger. We have the fortitude to stand our ground. And the only way that we do that is to study, is to, is to learn the ways of Christ and be committed to them, be committed to his commands and teaching others of his commands. I mean, that's the other role of a disciple is to teach others, not just to hold it to yourself. It's to teach others. And then it gets a little scary because what does Jesus say about becoming a disciple, right? That's a little different too, right? In, in the Christian world, you accept Christ, you get baptized, everything's wonderful, I'm saved, my life is great. But if you read what Jesus says in Matthew 14, 26 through 33, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when his laid foundation is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this, this man began to build but was not able to finish. And then he talks about the king. Um, the one at the end gets me, so none of you can be my disciples who does not give all his own possessions. Well, he's not talking about hating your parents or hating your brother. What he's talking about is giving up the world. Saying, I no longer belong to this place. This is not my home. My home is in heaven. My home is with the Lord. And if, if my brothers and my sisters and my family are, are in a different place, I have to accept the fact that even though biologically they're my family and I still love them, I'm moving on. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't want to let go of the past. We got one foot in this little water and this one here, and well, which way do we go? Well, what Jesus is saying is, if you're not committed, I don't even want you. If you're not going to commit to this, if you're going to do this halfway, don't even bother. It says the same thing in Matthew 9, 23 through 27. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. And then he talks about what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Yeah, well, that's commitment, isn't it? That's kind of scary. But the truth is, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you've already kind of committed to it. The problem is going to be is when you get to the end, what is he going to say to you? I don't think that God judges us on what we do or how good we do it, but I do think he judges us, judges us on our intent. And if we love him, we're going to want to serve, we're going to want to do what he wants us to do. So how do disciples behave? How will the world know that we are followers of Christ? Well, we find both of these answers in John 13, 33 and 34, where Jesus now is, is just about ready to be crucified, so he gets all the disciples around and he says, okay, I got, I got one last thing I got to tell you guys, okay? If you forget everything else, remember this one last thing. And of course, if you watch the video, it's kind of funny, but he talks about, you can just picture them all lean in, okay, and I give you. And they're like, okay, what's the new commandment? That you love one another. Even as, I, even as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And you think, that's it? Okay, that's not rocket science. Right? We're just going to love one another. We're going to be, right, didn't that happen in the 60s? Whoops. Oh, my foot fell off. So, it happened in the 60s. I just got I'm just going to have to hold it. You know, what kind of new command is that? Except that one little line you put in there, right? Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Even as I have loved you. He doesn't love the way we love. He doesn't think the way we think. His ways are not our ways. But what does scripture say about divine love? And if you notice, I got a lot of scripture here because as I'm doing this and I I had everything written kind of out, and I sat down last night at 7 o'clock, and I got done at like almost 2 o'clock, because as I'm doing this, all this other scripture popped in my head, oh, i got to write that down, i got to write that down. So, because I believe we need scripture to back this stuff up, right? So in 1 John 4, 7 through 12, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Where does it come from? It comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And then the, there's something interesting here. 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. It's easy to say, I love you. Okay, now I'm in the tank. Do you love me now? Now I'm, I'm at a point in my life that I'm struggling. Do you love me now? My car broke down. I need to use your car. Do you love me now? I don't have any food in the house. Do you love me now? Tells us to love with not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I found this interesting. First John 3.16, which I just read, is so similar to John 3.16. I thought, wow, that's really weird. And what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So number one, God loved us so much he sent his son to take our place. And then the interesting thing is it gets passed down to the son, right? So God first loved us, sent Jesus. Jesus loved us so much that he laid down his life for us. And we are called as disciples to love each other in the same way. Scripture says that a tree is known by its fruit. You've all heard that. That our, whatever kind of tree it is, it's going to produce a certain kind of fruit. And us as believers, our faith is going to produce likewise. If you have a weak faith, you're probably going to produce prunes, you know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So we're, if we're Christ's disciples, what kind of fruit should our love produce for each other? First and foremost, it should produce forgiveness. 
Because our faith is rooted in forgiveness, and if we don't have forgiveness, we don't have any faith. And I don't mean that to sound mean, but it's the truth. If we don't have forgiveness, we don't have any faith. You can't, how can we say we're followers of Christ if we can't forgive somebody? Matthew 18, 21 through 22 says, Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? How many times? Up to seven times, Lord? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And that doesn't mean you count 77 times. You say, okay, I don't have to forgive him anymore. That just means we just keep forgiving. Because he kept forgiving. He keeps forgiving you. Every day you screw up, or at least I do. And every day he forgives me. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. You're not going to be able to get up there and say, well, that person did me wrong, Lord. And accept, expect him to be happy about that. That's not going to happen that you didn't forgive that person. And it works the other way also. Uh, when someone feels that we wrong them in some way, we're to seek their forgiveness. Even if we don't think we did anything wrong. You know, I, all my years of being a Christian, I mean, that's the, I've heard so many times, I didn't do anything. Why should I, why should I, Ask for forgiveness. Well, obviously, the person that feels this way has received this differently than what you intended. So whether you, we need to humble ourselves and go to that person because everyone perceives things differently. We have to understand that. And also says, if you're offering a gift on the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother. Then come off your gift. And of course, we have the infamous, I, I've heard this one about a gazillion times. I may forgive, but I will never forget. Why? <laughs> I'm not going there. You're single, you get away with that. <laughs> Well, I hate to tell you guys, but if you're holding out of that teaching, it's not biblical. It's not biblical. We, I've, I've heard that a zillion times. Well, Christ asked me to forgive, but I don't have to forget. Wrong. Hebrews 8.12 For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God doesn't keep score of your sins. Jeremiah says no longer... Well, they teach their neighbor to say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. There's two, two stages there. There's forgiveness and forgetfulness. You know, you get in a fight with somebody and you bring up the past, right? Well, remember when... <coughs> wrong... We're not supposed to do that. The Psalms 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, how far is that? Exactly. He has removed our transgressions from us. I've seen more damage done in the churches, and not just this church, but every church I've gone to, because somebody has either refused to forgive or refuse to reconcile because of their stupid pride. And that's all it is, is stupid pride. And people leave the church, then they go out in the community, and of course this starts, and then this starts, and it's usually some stupid misunderstanding that really has nothing. I don't know if I'm early or not, but I'm getting near the end here. Um, the other thing, the other dominant 
fruit of love is mercy. I didn't put grace in here because I believe grace is something in the biblical sense is only, I mean, I've heard you, you offer somebody grace, but as far as the grace of, of God, I think that can only be given by God. But these other things, the forgiveness and the mercy, that's on us. You know, you, you can say a lot of things in the Bible and say, well, I'm going to give it to God. I'm just going to give it to God. I can't handle it. I'm going to do this. Except for these things. You can't give it to God. You have to forgive. You're going to be held accountable for that. Scripture says that. You're going to be held accountable. And mercy is not the same as forgiveness. I know sometimes it comes off that, off that way, but Mercy is compassion. It's compassion to your fellow believers, compassion to whoever. It's love. It's when the guy on the street corner is hungry, you feed him. When you're with somebody that doesn't have, you give them something. If they don't have, a, like Jesus said, if, you, if they don't have a jacket, you give them your jacket or your cloak, as he called it. Compassion oozes Christ. Oozes Christ. Because the thing about it is, you can say you love somebody, but until you show them that compassion, they're not going to feel it. Talk all you want. You know, it's like the saying I used to use all the time. Who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. And lastly, what is our main objective as a disciple of Christ? To pursue the Great Commission all the days of our life. That's the last thing he told them as he went to be with his father. Everybody know what the Great Commission is? I don't know if he's got it up there or not. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. To be a disciple of Christ, there is no higher calling. There is no higher calling. But my question for you today is, will you answer the call? Are you ready to go from just being a Christian to being a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are you ready to take the next step? You know, the thing is, when I do these and when I write songs, I know some of you guys know I write songs, it never fails to amaze me that I'm really talking to myself. This is coming out of here and going into here. And, and so when I stand up here, I'm not preaching to anybody but myself. Because I have to constantly remind myself to get off my butt and be what God called me to be. Even when I don't feel like getting out of bed, coming to worship practice on Sunday morning. Because it's cold out. So as, we, uh, as the worship team comes up, which is going to be me also. I would like to invite you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, please come forward. And I think, Gary, could you, Gary's going to come up here and, can you come up here and sit? And uh, if anybody needs to talk to him, our elder Gary will be up here. Um, but if you've decided today that you want to change the way things are going, you want to accept Jesus. You want to become one of his disciples. Gary would love to talk to you. Or if you want to place your membership with the church, if you already are a Christian, that would be awesome too. We can definitely use your help. Would you pray with me? Father God, I just pray today that um, we would act more like you. We would act more like Jesus, Lord. And that's exactly what a disciple is. Somebody that emulates the one they're following becomes more and more like them. And I just pray, Lord, that we would be committed to doing that. We would be committed to growing in our faith, growing in our love for one another. 
Help us to forgive each other when things happen, Lord. Because in the end, we just want to be like you, Lord. Just thank you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name.